It was in February 1951. We finally got electricity in Gay Head, and it was a big to-do in town. Some of the ladies in town put on this skit, and they had, like, part of the poles in, in a great big aluminum pan and sand in it like they were climbing the poles and stringing the wires and it it was funny I I can vividly remember it was a really nice production it was wonderful to get electricity my sister Judith and I were four and three at the time and one of the newspapers either the Boston Globe or the Providence Journal took a photograph of us looking at a light bulb and like Oh, a new toy, you know? So it was monumental. It was a very big deal. One of the reasons we didn't have electricity was because of the fact that they didn't think that the town could really afford it. Our mother was very involved with the Aquina Women's Club. So the the Aquina Women's Club had penny sales. They had potluck dinners. they, They did a lot of fundraising to be able to assist in obtaining electricity for Gay Head after we had electricity. What our grandfather did every morning was listen to the fish auction in New Bedford. You know, how much they got paid for uh, each species of fish. It It was a routine every morning. Once we had electricity, of course, we had black and white television. And one of our neighbors in East Pasture was was Max Eastman. Well, they didn't extend the electricity there for a long time. So every Friday night, Max Eastman, when he was in Gay Head, Max Eastman would come over to our home and watch the fights, the Friday night fights. So it was like having another uncle around. He was he was just a very, I, I loved him. He was a, a giant of a man. Everyone loved him. My great-grandfather, Francis Manning, I remember him vividly. He, he was just a dear, sweet man, very kind and gentle. He lived across the street from my grandparents off of Lighthouse Road. He had a big barn, which was in front of our house, and the barn was used by the family. They would mend fishing nets in the field, so we learned how to mend fishing nets at a young age. We stored cranberries there. We hung deer there during hunting season, and we had a lot of clay there that our other great-grandmother used for her craft work. She was Anna Madison Smalley. She would fill bottles, a lot of fancy bottles, with different colors of clay from the cliffs, with different layers of different colors. They were very pretty. She braided rugs. She made pot holders. She made yarn dolls, her beadwork. and her house around the dining room table, there was a bench, and it went around two sides of the room in the window. I loved going over there when I was little. It was all a family affair, and we would all sit there and work on things together. We helped her with everything, sorting the clay, cutting the wool for the rugs, helping her braid with the beadwork. She was the sister of Napoleon Madison, who was our medicine man at the time. He lived right across the street from her. And she and Napoleon would work all winter, make a lot of nice items to sell up at the cliffs, at the Aquinas shop, and they would be up there every summer. We talked all the time about history, about Cranberry Day, about the old trails, about the gay head cliffs. Anyone could take clay from the cliffs until 1966, when the cliffs became a national landmark. Even today, tribal members are still allowed to take clay. And we talked about the fishing, who was who. I just lived it. I lived it on a daily basis. It was wonderful. 